there is the offices, there is the gift of the spirit, and there is what? The ministry gifts. Let's look at the gifts of the spirit. And now, why am I beginning with the gifts of the spirit? The gift of the spirit is not a function of maturity. You can operate all the nine gifts of the spirit and be a babe. A baby in the spirit. It's a function of mastery, skill, and yieldedness. And I will show you from scripture. Many times, people master how to operate that gift or they master yieldedness, but they have not grown in the things of God. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 to verse 6, and chapter 3 from verse 1 Paul to verse 3, Paul was talking to the church in Corinth. Now, you know that that's one of the church that worked mostly in the gift of the Spirit. He said they did not come behind in any gift. That means the nine gifts were at work there. But Paul said they are babies. He said you are spiritual babes. You are immature. You are carnal. So carnal people manifest gifts of the spirit. It does not make, it does not show that you are mature. And that's why we are beginning from there. When we finish from there, we'll now start going into the ministry gifts. This one, the degree to which you manifest it is a function of your maturity. For example, the ministry of mercy. It takes higher level maturity in love and compassion to be able to walk in mercy. The ministry of giving, it takes higher level of revelation and understanding to be able to excel in that ministry. So you see that the other two spiritual gifts are a function of maturity. There can be three apostles. All of them are genuine apostles. But the authority level is a function of their maturity. Because these ones are entrustment. The degree to which you can bring government to a territory. The degree to which God can give you influence is a function of how much God can trust you. So these ones have to do with maturity. But when it has to do with the nine gifts, maturity is not in view. It's a function of skill, yieldedness, and practice. And so let's begin with the nine gifts of the Spirit. The nine gifts of the Spirit, like I listed for you already, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, Walkings of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirit, tongues, and interpretation of tongues are nine. For the purpose of understanding, although the Bible grades it different, I've shown you already, right? The Bible grades word of knowledge and word of wisdom in one category, and then it grades faith, healing, miracles, walkings of miracles, gifts of healing, discerning of spirit, and prophecy in another category. And then tongues, diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues in another category. So according to the Bible, the grading is actually 2, 5, 2. And if you study the Acts of the Apostles, you are going to see that that's how they manifested it. They began with tongues. They now entered into power, miracles. In Acts chapter 2 verse 1 to 3, they spoke in diverse kinds of tongues. The people understood them. They now went to Acts chapter 3. Paul healed somebody at the beautiful gate. Walking of miracles. They have entered the second category. And then you now come to Acts chapter 5. Paul began to operate in word of knowledge. When he spoke to Ananias and he died. So they were following it according. They grew in the energy level. But when we are teaching it doctrinally. In order to help people understand. We categorize them. Based on the part of your spiritual body. That operates them. So there are giftings. That are operated by your mouth by speaking they are speaking oriented we call them vocal gifts there are gifts of the spirit that are tied to your sensory organs like eyes and ears we call them revelational gifts and there are giftings that are tied to doings what you do what you can achieve we call them power gifts so that people can understand it and so they are broken into three, three for each of the three categories. The first category are the vocal gifts. And there are three gifts there. You have prophecy, you have diverse kinds of tongues, and you have interpretation of tongues. You see that all of them have to do with what? Speaking. The second category is what we call the power gifts. This one has to do with doing something supernaturally. That's why we call them power gifts. And you have gift of faith, you have gifts of healing and you have working of miracles. The third category are revelational gifts. It has to do with perceiving, seeing something or hearing something. So we call them revelational gifts. And there you have word of wisdom, 
word of knowledge and discerning of spirit of these three categories the vocal gift is the lowest level so we'll begin from the lowest and then we we'll go to the power gift then we we'll go to the revelational gift in acts of the apostles they began with vocal gift acts 2 verse 1 to 4 they went to power gift acts chapter 3 verse 1 to 6 hidden at the beautiful gate they now went to revelational gift acts chapter 5 verse 1 to 6 when paul spoke to ananias so revelational gifts are actually the highest realm in the operation of the gifts of the spirit let's begin with vocal gifts what are vocal gifts they are mostly gifts that are supernaturally manifested through utterance and speakings those are vocal gifts they are gifts that are what supernaturally and get the word supernatural it's not natural basically through what speakings and utterances there are three of them prophecy diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues of the vocal gift the most important is prophecy and if you study first corinthians 14 verse 3 you will see why let's go there and it's important for you to know this so that when you are operating this gift you will know the one that will bless people more our generation think tongues is more important than prophecy but that's not the bible's position in the bible prophecy is more important than tongues and interpretation you will see it here he said but he okay go to verse 2 so that you see the reason why because you may be raising people and all you are doing with them is tongues there's not a place where people are prophesying you may not grow and I can tell you, those of you who want to help yourself, go and check the body of Christ. Find out in our generation today, for example, most of the ministries that are controlling things at the helm of affairs, they are ministries that prophesy or teach the word. It's not that they don't pray. All of us must give ourselves to prayer. But predominantly, what builds people is prophecy. Prayer builds you. Prophecy builds the church. So in as much as you mentor people to pray as a church, make sure when you are done praying, let there be a prophetic word. Speak it over them. Because if you don't speak that prophetic word, after three years, four years, they will become weary. Because they will not be edified. They will not grow. And you will see that people will fall back to the word and they will start hating the church. See what Paul said. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. He said, For no man understandeth him. How be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Go to the next verse. He said, But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification, to exhortation, and to comfort. Go to verse 4. He said, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. So we must pray in tongues. Paul said, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you all. So this is not saying you shouldn't. But for a corporate gathering, he said, make sure you don't leave prophecy behind. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. He went to verse 5 and he now gave us an equation. I would that you all speak with tongues. So Paul is not discouraging us from speaking in tongues. He said, but rather that you prophesy. He said, For greater is he that prophesieth than him that speaketh with tongue, except he interpreted that the church may receive edification. Are you seeing that? So when you have prophecy and tongues and interpretation, the highest is prophecy. So as you pray in tongues and you grow in tongues, make sure you also desire to prophesy. Because that's what will edify people, especially if you are a leader over people otherwise they will not be edified and paul said when tongues is counteracted by interpretation then it becomes prophecy so tongues and interpretation is equal to prophecy are you following this this is the summary of the operation of the vocal gift why is it important to teach the vocal gift because the vocal gift is number one the most predominantly used gift in the body of christ number two it is the gift most misused 
and number three is the gift most abused so when we are teaching about the vocal gift our focus is to help you understand its operation so that you don't misuse it and you don't ab abuse it rather you benefit from it are you following so this is the the operation of the vocal gift now let's look at prophecy as we begin to touch vocal gifts remember this is just an overview right so i'll just touch basic important things i was teaching this to my mentees and the holy ghost prompted me to also teach it to us that's why i came to to, to do the teaching prophecy is a supernatural utterance divinely divinely imparted to a human vessel in a known language prophecy is a supernatural utterance or message or word divinely imparted to a human vessel in a known language we also call it spirit energized communication when prophecy goes forth it builds people so there is energy in a prophetic word now it's important for you to know that there's a difference between prophecy and word of knowledge and there's a difference between prophecy and word of wisdom many people confuse prophecy for word of knowledge and they confuse prophecy for word of wisdom so somebody said he wants to operate the gift of prophecy and he starts operating word of wisdom he doesn't know it right now because it's a teaching it's important to emphasize it word of wisdom deals with things that are in the knowledge or facts that are in the past and in the present the ability to bring it out it was not known you know it supernaturally that's word of knowledge i beg your pardon word of wisdom on the other hand has to do with facts that are in the future that are not known so when you expose something that is in the past or in the present that is not known by the spirit is called word of wisdom when you expose something that is in the future that is not known is why am i confusing it when you expose something that is in the past or in the present that is not known by the spirit is called word of knowledge when you expose something that is in the future that is not known supernaturally by the spirit is called word of wisdom prophecy on the other hand is the ability to speak energized words of the spirit so that the will the heart the mind of god is established so it may not talk secret but at the end of the day it will enforce the will of god it will enforce the heart of god and what god wants is done that is why revelation 19 10 said the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy so you may not be talking secret but you are prophesying for example somebody may be heartbroken and you just walk up to that person maybe he's disappointed from a relationship he's heartbroken business didn't work you may not know that he just he or she just came out from a breakup but you just come to the person and you tell the person god asked me to tell you that he's with you fear not your future is great you didn't tell the person your name is matter you didn't tell the person about a secret but that thing you said is the heart of god concerning that person because you said it the person will be energized what you have done by the spirit is called prophecy now when you are doing word of knowledge somebody who operates in word of knowledge can call you and say your name is sunday and he can also call your phone number he can call where you live now that's very important you know why it's important because it opens their heart to receive ministration it activates their faith so they now become expectant anything god says they can now receive that's why god does that remember in john chapter 1 from around verse 42 when peter andrew brought peter to jesus before he spoke to jesus jesus said you are simon uh -uh. he said but your name shall no longer be simon but cephas because you are rock if jesus just look at him and say now you are cephas he will say no sir my name is simon but because jesus supernaturally discerned his name if jesus said now change this name he knows this man who knows my name if he says change it i better listen so when we give word of knowledge you see in many places people are calling phone numbers call all of that is to open the heart of people it's very important because if you don't do it there are some people who will never believe god 
when you are talking, they are shaking their head because they think it's grammar. But when they come, you'll say, 0, 8, 1, 4, 6, 8, 3, 2, uh, yes, sir, 9, 8, 4. God is telling you, if you don't stop stealing, you will die. Trust me, he will never steal his life again. Because this God that knows his phone number, if he says he will die, he better listen. Tomorrow he will come to church and say, what do I do to stop stealing, sir? I want to serve God. That's how Jesus got his disciples. When Philip showed up, he said, ah, an Israelite in whom there's no guy. The guy looked at him. Who is this one? Why, why, why do you say so? Are you just trying to impress me? He said, no. When you were under the fig tree, before Philip met you, I saw you. My Lord and my God. <laughs> Speak. Your servant is listening. So, that's the beauty of word of it opens people's heart. You see? So don't discourage people who give word of knowledge. I, I see a lot of times, sometimes we are preaching, and because we are careful not to allow people to abuse this thing, we start saying, Why are you calling no phone number? Why are you calling them? It's important. It opens the heart of people, it tests their faith. But it must not stop there. After you do that, then give them the word of the Lord. Either conviction or transformation or a blessing. That way their faith can now receive it. But that is not prophecy. That's word of knowledge. Then word of wisdom is talk about the future. Ah, tomorrow you are about to take a journey to Lagos. Please don't go. How do you know I'm going to Lagos? It's word of wisdom. Because of that, the person will follow the advice and it will be preserved. So these giftings open people up so that faith can be born and they can receive. But prophecy is very important. It brings you the mind of God so that you are empowered to do the will of God. But this is not something you do from head knowledge. This is something you do because there's a supernatural energizing. Are you following this? So, you may be operating gift of prophecy, you don't have word of knowledge. Do it. It will bless people. You can come to church and you are just worshipping and you are singing and suddenly you start declaring, you shall not die but live to proclaim the goodness of the Lord. You didn't call anybody and said, I saw you. No, you didn't do word of knowledge. But you are saying it. Anybody who is under attack, that word will bring energizing. You have prophesied to that person. It's by the spirit. And because you said it, you didn't just encourage the person. Energy will hit that person and will save that person from death. That's the power of prophecy. So it's a supernatural utterance, divinely inspired or imparted in a known language. And there are three dimensions of the operation of prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3 that we read, Paul said, number one is for what? Edification. Number two is for exhortation. And number three is for comfort. Why did Paul do this? Paul did this because Paul knew that some people may start prophesying and say they are prophets. That's where you have a problem. If you are not a prophet, everything about your prophecy should be edification, exhortation and comfort there are some people that God gives them the gift of prophecy and all they are doing is to threaten people when they speak to people they become afraid and fearful and their life no longer moves forward that's no longer prophecy if it is prophecy it's for what? edification, exhortation and comfort you must be mindful to know this a prophet sits in an office so God can give him judgment for a people and he will speak from his office as a prophet. At that level, he's no longer operating prophecy. He's operating as a prophet. Because a prophet has prophecy and two other revelational gifts. Either word of knowledge and word of wisdom, or word of knowledge and discerning of spirit, or word of wisdom and discerning of spirit. But there must be prophecy. So based on what he sees and based on the commandment God gives him, he can bring a judgment. That is God sending him as a prophet. But if you are operating the gift of prophecy, it must be what? Edification, exhortation, and comfort. And having said that, let me say this. You can have the gift of prophecy. It doesn't make you a prophet. But if you are a prophet, you will have the gift of prophecy. Do you follow that? Are you following? Many, many times you hear us talk about the prophetic. The prophetic. The prophetic involves four things. Prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discerning of spirit. Everybody who is a prophet has prophecy and two other gifts. And they have the authority of God to operate in that office. And when I'm talking about prophets, I will deal with it. 
but this is what prophecy is about now to understand this let's understand what edification is open first corinthians 14 verse 3 you will find three things to help you understand prophecy you need to understand the meaning of these words edification exhortation and comfort the word edification if you click your strong concordance bible you will find that the word edification how many of you have strong bible you have okay click on uh, first corinthians 14 3 where the bible said edification click it what do you see there give her a mic oiko oikonomi give him the microphone give me two definitions that the word gave i'm trying to help you understand prophecy so that if you have it you will know and if somebody is operating it you will know yes please oikodome oikodome that's edification what is it building up building up are you seeing that so when prophecy is at work the goal is to build up it can build up your business it can build up your spiritual life it can build up everything about you that's why you see that the bible said the house kept growing by the prophesying of Zechariah, the son of Edo, as they are talking, is growing because it's a spirit energized word. And so, when somebody is prophesying, many times what he will do is to bring words that will build up your destiny. And so, in First Corinthians 13, verse 9, Paul said, We know in part, we prophesy in part. You may be going through a situation that makes you feel that Kai, this ministry will not work, and then suddenly somebody comes to you and tells you. The hand of God is upon your life. And God will use you for the nations. Ah, you are encouraged. You go to another place. Somebody else looks at you and says, Don't worry how the resources will come. The Lord that sent you will use you. They didn't tell you you are called. You are an apostle. I saw your name is God we know. They just brought you energized words. And as you are gathering those words, a point will come you discover that you will become who God says you should be. Because what? Oikodome has taken place. That's prophecy. And for a Christian... When God gives you words for people, don't take it for granted. They are building up, depends on it. You may not know all the details about somebody. What you have may be prophecy. Celebrate it. It builds up. And when God is speaking to you also, don't take it for granted. That word comes with energy to build. What's the second word for prophecy? Edifying. Edification. Yeah, no. You have dealt with edification. What's the second word? Exhortation. Click on the word. What do you have? Okay. You are mighty on your own. Yes? First Corinthians 14 3. Exhortation. Exhortation is paraclesis. Paraclesis. Give me one definition. A calling near. Call near. Summons. Summoning. So when Prophecy is at work. You know, most times as we are walking through the Christian life, a point comes, you feel lonely. Especially when you are under attack. You will feel lonely. You will feel alone. You are in a business. You feel alone. It's as if help is not coming from anywhere. Nobody is coming to assist you. Nobody is coming to help you. And a point comes, you are so lonely, you want to give up. When prophecy comes, what prophecy does is that it gives you encouragement not to give up in the journey of life. The reason most of us came this far is because at different junctions where we should have given up, prophecies kept coming. And the second thing prophecy does is that it increases the presence of God. You will now become conscious that you are not alone. God is with you. So when prophecy is at work, the real gift of prophecy, if you hear it, you become more conscious of God. You become more aware of God. And there will be encouragement to go on in life. The third word is what? Comfort. Click it. What does it say? So you have oikodomi, you have paraclesis, and you have paramutia. 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 What? Give me one definition. Any address, whether made for the purpose of persuading, persuasion, or arousing and stimulating. Persuasion is the key word. You know what persuasion stands for? The Bible said the righteous may fall seven times. It says seven times he will rise again. So what prophecy does? is to stop you from giving up god says you are a prophet but you are fornicated four times 
you know that car if it's ministry me I'm, I'm not called I will I, it will not work and then just after you fell now this is not God telling you to fornicate nothing is wrong but just after you fell and you have judged yourself and condemned yourself somebody just walks in and God tells you I'll send you to the nations and by your voice nations will repent you know what it will do it will persuade you that God has not given up on you that's the job of prophecy to bring consistent persuasion so that no matter how deep you have fallen you will rise again you who were a drunk you have disappointed everybody including yourself and you feel you are no longer qualified a prophecy now comes and God tells you and then you feel encouraged so you gather yourself and you rise up again so the operation of prophecy is unto building up calling you alongside and encouraging you to rise and not to fall this is how many people who succeed or succeeded in life and ministry succeeded it's called prophecy god gives utterance to us so that we can build ourselves up so that we can encourage ourselves and so that we can comfort ourselves when it happens supernaturally by the spirit not because you heard the story of someone there is different to hear that oh that brother stole and then you come and you say don't worry god will help you god will raise you god will use you that's encouragement that's not prophecy uh, do you understand what i'm saying but when it comes by the spirit it will lift the person up that is how prophecy works and many of us must master how to allow that gift to work through us the gift of prophesying now there is a development of the grace for exhortation like i'm preaching to you now this is not gift of prophecy this is a, this is exhortation this one is not a gift of or of the holy ghost this one is a grace that i developed through practice now preaching and prophecy can produce similar result it doesn't mean they are the same when i preach to you you can be built up when i preach to you you can be encouraged when i preach to you, you can be comforted this one takes training so this is different the holy ghost is the one helping me but it's not a gift of the spirit are you seeing it so on one side we must grow the ability to exhort but on another side those of us who have the gift of prophecy we must master it are you following there are differences between prophecy and preaching or edification and i give you four of them quickly number one prophecy is a gift preaching and exhortation is a growth four years ago i wasn't preaching like this if i carry the microphone in five minutes everywhere is on fire sometimes you won't even hear what i'm saying but everywhere is already boiling i enter the third heaven i'm talking mysteries but now i have to build people so i have to teach them a b c d i'm growing in it and in the next 10 years i'll be better you see that but once in a while prophecy can come and i can declare this week god will bless you i was doing during the 30 days fast many prophecies came i'm teaching and i just hear everybody who is in debt your debtors will bring the money and you'll see testimonies flying everywhere what went to trouble the debtors to bring the money energy went forth it's prophecy i'm preaching and i tell some people that business will be completed that visa will be granted and then testimonies kept flooding in one woman testified from italy they wanted to buy a property they didn't have money to buy it the week i spoke three days later they dashed them that same property they dashed them property that they, their savings could not afford because prophecy went forth it went with energy it may take many years of preaching to build her faith to be able to claim that property but because it's prophecy it was instant it's a gift it's not a growth the second difference between prophecy and preaching is that prophecy is instant preaching is a process the third difference between prophecy and preaching is that prophecy is controlled by the will of the holy ghost preaching is regulated by the will of the man as i'm preaching any angle i can navigate into if i say next week is a healing service i can put my will in a way that i navigate towards it and i preach in that direction people will receive healing but i can be doing that healing service and god begins to speak about nations so one is regulated by the will of the holy ghost which is prophecy another one is regulated by my will and then finally 
Prophecy is an operation of the anointing upon. Preaching is an operation of the anointing within. He said you have an unction from the Holy Ghost. First John 2, 20 and 27. He said that anointing teaches you all things. So as you are stirring and growing this anointing, you are becoming better. But when prophecy comes upon you, it hijacks and delivers God's mind. This is the gift of prophecy. Now the, set, the next gift on that vocal gift is the gift of tongues. It's actually called the gift of diverse kinds of tongues. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 10. Diverse kinds of tongues. This is a supernatural utterance given to a man by God to communicate a message in an unknown language. Is what? A supernatural utterance given by God to a man to communicate a message in an unknown language. It's called diverse kinds of tongues. There are three things you must know about this gift. Number one is supernatural. Number two is a message to a people. And number three is an unknown language. That's why Paul said this gift will require interpretation for it to be relevant. Now, there are a few things we need to explain under this subject. Because there are three major operations when you are dealing here. The first operation is what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. The second operation is what Paul spoke about in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 and 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14. And the third operation is what Paul spoke about in 1 Corinthians verse 4, chapter 14, verse 3 to verse 5. You will notice that in, first, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, when they spoke, it was unknown tongue because they didn't know the tongue. But the people understood them. So they were speaking unknown tongues to them, but the people understood. They spoke 18 languages. They didn't train for it. They spoke it supernaturally. The second operation is in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 and verse 14. Paul said, when we speak in an unknown tongue, he said, we are speaking not to men but to God. He said, men may not understand it. He said, but in the spirit, we are uttering mysteries. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, he said, when I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayed, but my understanding is unfruitful. So I don't know what I'm saying. Are you seeing that? So when you are praying or talking in unknown tongue to yourself, you will need to pray for interpretation. And then the third operation is when you are giving it as a message to a church. So I can come here and say I have a message for the church. And I speak in tongues. Somebody comes up and interprets it. Like Dana the Hassan was speaking on Sunday. Some persons brought the interpretation, but there were many. So we needed to censor it to know the mind of God before we, we give it to the church. I received some of the messages he sent. And I called him today and, and spoke to him. And he confirmed that some of them were the things God told him. Right? So it, it can be a message to a people in an unknown tongue. Are you following this? Now, why am I explaining this? So that you understand how it works. If it's a prayer, it doesn't need interpretation. You know why? Because you are talking to God. God knows every language. So you are not interpreting to God if it's a prayer. That's 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2 and 14 and 15. You are talking to God. God doesn't need interpretation. Now, if you are talking to yourself, Paul said you should pray for interpretation because if you don't know the meaning, it won't profit you. And then if you are speaking to the church, Paul said, if we speak, 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28, he said when we speak, one person, two person, three person, he said let them wait. Let somebody interpret so that the people understand and be edified. Now, most times when we are dealing with this subject, a lot of people come and they are bringing arguments like when they spoke in Acts chapter 2, the people not understand them. That was not the only time they spoke in tongues. Did you check Acts 14 verse 2 and 14? Paul said, no man understand, not even you who is talking. So, it's not all the time you speak diverse tongues that people understand. I don't understand Yoruba. I can come now and start talking in Yoruba. I may not know what I'm saying, but a Yoruba person we know. That's diverse tongues. It's a diverse tongue because I don't know it. It's an unknown tongue to me, but somebody else knows it. 
and then I can come here and speak the language of angels. And as I'm talking, I don't know what I'm saying. Somebody now stands up and says, this is what the Lord is saying. God is saying that he's going to bless you. He's going to lift you. And then we say, Amen. And we receive it. And then I can speak even in my closet to myself. When I see that it's a message, I will now start praying, Lord, grant interpretation. And the Holy Ghost can give me interpretation. And I'll be blessed. Now, it's important to know this so that we don't abuse the gift. Because many times we abuse it. Now, see the word Paul used in 1 Corinthians 14, 27, 23 and 24. Check it for me. 1 Corinthians 14, 23 and 24. You know, this was a strong word. See, he said, if the whole church comes together in one place and all are speaking in tongues, and somebody comes in who is either unlearned or an unbeliever, he said, that person will say, you are mad. So no matter the spiritual essence, he said, that person considers it as madness. So when we are addressing the church, if God gives us a message for the church in tongues, we must make sure there's an interpretation. If there's no interpretation, after the message is delivered, we must pray and ask God to give us an interpretation so that we can apply the message. However, if we have a gathering where we are not involving outsiders, we can choose to pray in tongues so that all of us are edified. Because we didn't invite an unbeliever. It's a meeting of the brethren. It's a meeting of leaders. It's a meeting of a people who know the operation. So there is a context where church can gather and we can choose to blow in tongues. And as we are praying in tongues, a point will come when the gift will start working and God will now give a message. And the person speaks a message in tongues and then this is a message, this is a message and then somebody starts up and interprets it and then we are blessed and we go away. So you need to know that there is praying in tongues and there is diverse kinds of tongues. Praying in tongues is when you are speaking in an unknown language to God. It doesn't need interpretation. But diverse kinds of tongues is when the Holy Ghost gives you a message to a people. And that one requires an interpretation. Now when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you start praying in tongues, you can pray in tongues at will. But you cannot operate diverse kinds of tongues at will. Diverse kinds of tongues is a message that God gives part time to a people. So while you are praying in tongues, you are sensitive. If the message comes, you give it and somebody will interpret. So while you are talking in an unknown language, you must be discerning to know when you are talking to God and you must be discerning to know when God is giving a message. If God is giving a message, if you are alone, ask for interpretation. And if you are in a congregation, ask the people, does anybody have interpretation so that they will be profited? Otherwise, the gift will be abused. So there are controversies around this gift. Should we say it in public? Yes. If there's an interpreter. And if it is not a message in tongues, we have the liberty to pray in tongues. If there are no unbelievers among us. If there are unlearned people among us, we teach them like I'm teaching you now so that they will join the flow. If there are no unbelievers, we can pray in tongues. Are we following this? And then if you read verse 27 and 28, it said, pick one, two, and three and stop. It doesn't mean we should give only three messages. God can give 20 messages. But what Paul is saying is that for the purpose of order and benefit, if three messages come, let's pause. Receive the interpretation first before we receive more. If we receive another three, pause. Get interpretation. Now see what Pastor Dandadi was doing on Sunday. Imagine if 10 people start doing it at the same time. It will become chaotic. So if three people have message, let one give the message. We receive interpretation. Another one give. We receive interpretation. So at the end of the day, we get the whole subject matter. Is that clear? That's how the gift works. The second thing I want to touch about the gift is that this gift is called interpretation, not translation. So as we are operating this gift, the message can be very short, but the interpretation may be very, very long. That's where a lot of people get a bit confused. They are wondering, oh, why is it so? It's not, it's not something that is not a translation. It's an interpretation. And as I enter interpretation of tongues, I will go into that so that you look at it carefully. But basically, it's supernatural. It's an unknown language. And it's a message to a people. And when it is given, 
ensure that there's an interpreter so that the church can be edified. The third vocal gift is interpretation of tongues. Interpretation of tongues is a supernatural ability divinely imparted to interpret a message in an unknown language. This is not a language you know because it's not natural, it's supernatural. This is a language you do not know but it was supernaturally given to you for the purpose of interpreting that message so that the church can be edified. And like I said already, it is not a translation, it is an interpretation. So the interpretation can be far longer than the message. In Daniel chapter 5, verse 25 to verse 28, let me give you an example. Look at this. Daniel 5, 25 to 28. There was a message in tongue, four words, and this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, teke, ofasin. Four words. See the interpretation. This is the interpretation of the, of the team. Mene. See what mene is. Do you see why God now gives us you see why God allows us to pray in tongues? All the prayer points you want to pray in five hours. When you say, Rak teko parakatoa. You may have covered prayer in, in your known language for four hours. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, eh, verse 14, verse 15. He said, what will I do? He said, I will pray in the spirit. I will pray in my understanding also. I will pray more in the spirit. Because one word in the spirit can be ten sentences in your understanding. So when you come to God, it's good to pray your understanding. Father, I love you. Lord, bless me. Lord, lift me. But that prayer you pray your understanding for five hours, you can say, Barakos Tatakira Paragata. It will cover it. See what is happening here. Mene. What is Mene? God had numbered thy kingdom and finished it. So one word in tongue is a sentence in understanding. Go to the next one. Take it. Thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. And then when interpretation came, modification now happened. Over Perez. Over sin now. Thy kingdom is divided and given to what? The ladies and the patients. God can send you to a church and say there's a message in tongue and he gives you ga la goba. The church may use it for 10 years. That's the power and the beauty of these giftings. This is why we must master them and walk in them. We will stop here tonight. There are Four things, five things I will show you to operate this gift. But I will teach it when I'm dealing with power gifts. The principles that control operating gifts of the spirit. Number one is consciousness. You must become conscious that you have a gift. If you are not conscious, you will not work in it. First Samuel 9, 19. When they met Samuel, Samuel said, I am the seer. I know I have it. If you don't have the consciousness that you have a gift, you won't work in it. That's the first principle for manifesting any gift. I have healing, me. I have the gift of working on miracles. I know it. And because I have the consciousness, if I'm going anywhere, I'm trusting God to heal the sick. It's a trigger. Don't joke with it. Number two is the principle of faith. Believe that it will work. Otherwise, it will not work. 2 Corinthians 4.13 according as it is written they believe and have spoken we having the same spirit of faith believe and therefore speak number three principle unction i told you already about atmosphere build enough of it you saw jesus carry enough luke 6 19 the bible said they touched him virtue left him healed them all luke 10 17 he said he was preaching the power of god was present to heal there was unction build unction Principle number four, desire and expectation. Want it. If you don't want it, you won't see it. First Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12.1, it says desire spiritual gifts. Desire it. First Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14.1, desire spiritual gifts. 
In Proverbs 23, 18, he said, the expectation of the righteous shall not be cut off. If you don't desire it and if you don't expect it, it won't happen. And then finally, principle of selflessness. It must be about people first. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach glad tidings to the poor. If it's about the people, the gift will start working. If you have these five principles, then you will walk in the gift of the Spirit. When next we come, we will deal with the power gift. My time is up. Lift your hands and pray. Elohim Adonai.